morning, everybody. For those that are um, I'm Dave Finkler. I'm taking over for Dr. P today. You guys are in for a treat. We have two of our wonderful residents, Dr. Elika Rasuli and Dr. Lauren Cantwell. Um, and Elika will be up first talking about a case of a two-month-old with fever. All right. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So uh, my name is Elika Rasuli, as Dr. Finkler mentioned. I'm a second year, almost third year uh, pediatric resident, and I'll be talking about a case of a two-month-old with a fever. I don't have any disclosures. So um, starting with the history of present illness, we have a two-month-old girl who presents with intermittent fevers for the last week. She was actually sent from her primary care doctors for concerns of, of dehydration and also possible gastroenteritis. She was seen in our emergency department six days prior for, again, fever and fussiness. At that time, she was well appearing. She did have a little bit of congestion and runny nose. They did a flu swab, which was negative, a UA, which was unremarkable, and then the culture eventually came back and that was, was negative. She was discharged home at that time with symptomatic treatment for a viral upper respiratory tract infection. But she comes back now six days later um, with fever. She had been afebrile for two days in between that time, but her fever returned a couple days ago with a Tmax of 100.9, so not that high of a fever. She also had associated vomiting and diarrhea for um, the last day. Her mom, she's very fussy, she's not able to sleep. She has decreased oral intake, but still her um, urine output is still appropriate. At home, she has a couple siblings that are sick with a diarrheal illness. So she um, was born at 37 weeks via a spontaneous vaginal delivery, no pregnancy or labor delivery complications. Mom was GBS negative, and um, she also didn't have any history of maternal HSV. She's only received the hepatitis B vaccine um, and, and has not had her appointment quite yet to receive her two-month um, vaccine. Otherwise, she's healthy, no past surgical history, no allergies. Uh, mom has been giving her acetaminophen for her fever. And the family history really here, here is not contributory. She does live with her mom, mom's boyfriend, four half-siblings, no pets and no smokers. So her vital signs, her blood pressure is a, a little bit elevated for a, a two-month-old, but she was very fussy when it was taken, so it's not quite accurate. Her temperature of uh, 101.8, and which is elevated and then also tachycardic at 176. Her other vitals are, are within normal limits. So on exam, she does appear ill. Um, she has moments of irritability, but still is consolable um, for the ED um, report. She has a, um, for her head, a soft but still full anterior fontanelle. Um, it wasn't described as, as bulging. In her mouth, she has white patches, and the buccal mucosa consistent with thrush, um, but no ulcerations and no vesicles. She's tachycardic, otherwise no murmurs. Her lungs, she's breathing comfortably, and her lungs are clear to auscultation. Abdomen is benign. She has delayed cap refill to three to four seconds. No rashes, and she's otherwise moving her extremities well and, and good strength of tone. So just to quickly summarize, we have a two-month-old girl who comes in with fever, vomiting, associated vomiting and diarrhea. She's ill-appearing and irritable. She has this full anterior fontanelle on exam, and there's evidence of moderate dehydration. She had lost, actually, 3% um, of her birth weight within um, two days. So at this time, we're thinking this, you know, what, what's common is common, so she could have a viral gastroenteritis. Um, she's, she doesn't have any congestion or runny nose at this time, but we always think of viral or respiratory tract infection. Um, and then a, um, also a UTI. She did have a, a UA that was done a week, about a week ago, and that was normal. But then we also think, want to think about um, some more serious causes, given that she's ill-appearing, she's irritable, she has this full anterior um, fontanelle, and she's, and she's dehydrated, so we think meningitis or encephalitis. So she did get her, her initial workup, showed a low white count of 3,200, but otherwise um, the rest of the CDC was unremarkable. Her BMP 
um, at a mildly low bicarb of 19. Their CRP is quite elevated at 6.24. UA is normal um, and flu was done again and that was negative. Blood cultures were also drawn. So given the fact of her, her physical exam, her elevated CRP, um, and really no focal findings on her, on her physical, um, it was decided to do a lumbar puncture. So the LP is, is quite remarkable. Her protein is elevated at 183. Her glucose, nearly nothing, less than five. And her cell count uh, shows elevated white cells um, and quite a bit of RBCs, but if you account for those um, red cells, she still has an elevated um, white count. Sorry, white count. Looking at her differential, she has a neutrophilic predominance. Um, and then gram stain eventually came back um, showing two gram negative rods and the culture is, is pending. So in the emergency department, she received two IV fluid boluses with improvement of her tachycardia. She also received acetaminophen uh, for her fever. And she was started on ceftriaxone and ampicillin empirically for concerns of uh, bacterial meningitis. And then she was admitted to our ICU. So in the ICU, the same day she arrived, um, gentamicin was added for better coverage of uh, gram-negative bacteria. On day one, blood culture grew gram-negative rods, um, consistent with also the CSF. And she started to have multiple episodes of jerking movements of her upper um, left upper extremity and left lower extremity concerning for seizures. So she was loaded with IV levoteracetam twice and started on maintenance therapy. On day two, her CSF and blood culture bo both grew H influenza and later on um, the serotyping came back for type A H influenza, which is quite rare. We'll talk about that. Ampicillin and gentamicin were discontinued as she was continued solely on the ceftriaxone at this time. Day three, uh, both seizure activity continued. She was loaded with phosphenitoin and maintenance therapy was started with no real improvement. So a midazolam drip was, um, was started and she was placed on non-invasive ventilation. Days four through five, she started to have general tonic-clonic seizures. The midazolam drip was increased and phenobarb was added and the patient was subsequently intubated. She had um, several imaging studies done. The CT showed a, um, a CT of the head showed bifrontal and parietal subdural effusions. And then the MRI um, also was consistent with that. Oh, it's frozen. Maybe it'll take some time, I don't know. <laughs> And then um, there, there was no evidence of empyema um, on her MRI, and it also can be sort of here. And then she had some meningeal enhancement as well in the frontal and parietal um, regions. So we're going to talk about H influenza meningitis, and then I have a couple of slides about type A um, H influenza. So it's a pleomorphic gram-negative cogobacillus. It's, there's encapsulated strains and non-encapsulated strains. Um, the encapsulated ones express one of six capsular polysaccharides, A through F, and the non-encapsulated obviously lack these um, capsule genes. So they're considered non-typical, and then the encapsulated is called type. The, the non-typical H influenza typically causes respiratory tract infections, but since um, our Hib vaccine, and this has shifted. Now we're seeing more non-typable and also typable, um, non-B typable H influenza. Um, 
from uh, just looking at the CDC data, um, before the HIV vaccine um, in America, we were seeing about 70 to 130 cases per 100,000 children um, per year of HIV, and then after the HIV vaccine, it has significantly decreased to less than 0.5 per 100,000. And then in regards to the non-typable H influenza, um, we're seeing about seven cases per 100,000 um, per year, and these are kids under the age of five. So this is a gram stain of um, H influenza. It's um, gram negative, pink, and then this be, these look like rods to me, but they're just described as cockles and bacillus. And then we have inflammatory cells here. So it's uh, H. influenza is transmitted um, in neonates by intrapartum aspiration of amniotic fluid or by contact of the genital tract secretions, but we don't see very much in the neonatal period because of maternal antibodies. Uh, infants and children by inhalation of the respiratory tract droplets or by contact with respiratory secretions. So, so several risk factors in a child less than five years old. And then surprisingly, American Indians and Alaska Natives, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and anyone that's immunocompromised, so sickle cell, HIV, immunoglob immunoglobulin and complement component deficiencies, anyone that's receiving chemotherapy, radiation, or uh, requiring a stem cell transplant. So how they present, we're going to focus more on the neonates and infants because our, our patient was two months old. The signs and symptoms are quite subtle, they're variable, they're nonspecific, sometimes they're even absent. So the clinician really needs to have a high index of suspicion um, for meningitis. And, and just to note, specifically for H. influenza, it's often more insidious than meningococcal or pneumococcal meningitis. So some of the signs and symptoms, temperature instability is the most common, listlessness, lethargy, irritability, refusal to feed, weak suck, vomiting, diarrhea, respiratory distress, so all very nonspecific. Um, you know, we think of bulging fontanelle with meningitis, but um, about a third of, of infants have bulging fontanelle, and that's mostly uh, late in the course of the illness. It's most commonly described as a cold. Seizures are seen in 20 to 20, 20 to 50%. So diagnosis, obviously, you want to collect CSF, and then the PCR detects the serotype of um, the type of H influenza, blood culture, um, and then supportive blood work, like CBC chemistry, the inflammatory markers are helpful to trend. Treatment, um, so empiric antibiotics, um, if you're suspecting meningitis, go ahead and start empiric antibiotics if they're less than a month. Amp and uh, cefotaxime or ampicillin in the third generation, I'm sorry, or um, ampicillin and aminoglycoside. Greater than a month, um, you'd use vancomycin in a third generation cephalosporin. So once the H. influenza has been confirmed, treatment is based on production of, a beta, of the beta lactamase. So if um, it's beta lactamase negative, you would treat with ampicillin, and if it's beta lactamase positive, you can go ahead and treat with the third generation cephalosporin. And this will be reported on the sensitivities. Now, um, there's a lot of differing um, data and research on dexamethasone for treatment of uh, meningitis. So it has been shown to reduce hearing loss, specifically in HIV. Um, meningitis, but it does not decrease mortality. So there are several things that you need to think about before um, administering dexamethasone. Um, Trying to think of what is the etiologic agent of the meningitis, and sometimes this is hard because you need, going to the second point, you need to administer it before at the same time of, of the first dose of antibiotic. And then you also want to think about what empiric antibiotic regimen you're going to start that um, entry of vancomycin is, in the CSF is actually decreased in patients who receive dexamethasone. And then, of course, with steroids, you want to think about the potential side effects. Talking about H-influenza type A or HIA, um, 
as a, again, as I mentioned, because of the diminishing incidence of hip disease, we're seeing more infections due to other capsular and non-capsular types, but especially HIA. Um, it's the most virulent among the encapsulated H influenza after HIB, and um, the pathogenicity um, of HIA is actually similar to HIB, so the treatment is the same, the management is, is the same. Um, there's been some various North American indigenous populations that um, HIA has, em has emerged as the most common encapsulated serotype causing invasive disease. Our patient, to our knowledge, was not um, in any of these indigenous populations, but she's still positive for HIA. So the incidence in Alaska natives, less than five, um, is a, quite a big range, so 18 to 72 per 100,000 versus one per 100,000 in, um, in, uh, in all of Alaska. And then Canadian natives, we're seeing 80 to 100 per 100,000 um, versus 1.6 1, 1. per 100,000 in, in, um, in Canada nationally. So chemoprophylaxis, it's been well described in um, patients in close contact of, of persons with uh, hip meningitis. There's lots of good evidence on that. But looking at non b typeable disease, there's not very much um, in regards to whether you should give the close contacts chemoprophylaxis. Um, so there's absence of data regarding carriage of um, HIA and actually efficacy of um, the antibiotic. So there has been some studies suggesting that a patient that's getting recurrent HIA, um, that's suggesting transmission from a close contact, so you may want to treat those close contacts. So complications in general is related to the severity of the inflammatory process in the subarachnoid space. Um, hearing loss, you see it um, most, com most commonly in HIB, 5% in HIB, and then again some case reports that mention hearing loss in patients with HIA. Subdural effusion, again most common with um, H, H influenza compared to other uh, bacteria causes of meningitis. And invasive treatment really is not necessary if the patient is improving. So our patient was improving and it was very mild subdural, so no invasive um, management was done. And then epilepsy, of course, and then cognitive and developmental delay. And, and some of the case reports I read, they're seeing also developmental delays in patients with HIA. I think I spoke really good. Um, so the patient eventually was um, seizures improved, so it was weaned off of midazolam drip, extubated, weaned off of levetiracetam and phosphenitoin, but started to spike fevers again um, at day seven. And this is also common when looking at some case reports with, a, with um, HIA that they have prolonged course of, of illness. So a repeat blood culture was done and that was negative and inflammatory markers were drawn and um, those improved um, over the course of her, her illness. And then it, she was having, she started to have some congestion, runny nose, so an RVAP was done and it was positive for rhinovirus. She completed a total of 16 days of antibiotics and that's a odd number, but um, she was persistently febrile. We continued it a little over than two, over than two weeks. She had a repeat MRI that was done um, of her head, which showed mild improvement in her subdural effusions. And then um, once she was afebrile, she eventually received those two-month vaccinations in the hospital. Once um, she was discharged, once she remained afebrile for a little over than 48 hours. So just some teaching points. Again, signs and symptoms of meningitis are subtle and nonspecific, so we should really have a high index of, of suspicion um, in order to diagnose this in, in the neonatal um, and infant population. So again, incidence of HIP has significantly decreased because of our great vaccine. That doesn't mean that we should not vaccinate um, patients with, with HIP. Um, but now we're seeing more of a non-VH influenza, non-typable, causing the majority of invasive disease. And then they also looked at 
vac vaccination for HIA, but there's not very many um, individuals that have that that get HIA. So I don't know if that's going to happen soon. <laughs> I have a quick question, it's not very hard. <laughs> so we have a two-week-old male infant presenting with one-day history of a temperature of 102 Fahrenheit. Um, the, the baby's also irritable and has poor feeding. Uh, CBC blood culture, urinalysis, and urine culture are obtained. The LP is attempted five times without success. And as many of you know, that can sometimes happen. Of the following, the best next step in management is <laughs> yes, yeah, antibiotics. You're going to do some of the other things. You're going to measure serum electrolytes, um, and maybe you're going to repeat the LP the next day, but not right now. <laughs> All right, and I am done. These are some of my these are my references, and questions. For those of us who are gray, um, we frequently saw H flu uh, complications and infections when we were in training. Mm -hmm. My question is about because of the in the increased probability of seizures and actual uh, neurological complications, it, would there ever be consideration for loading of patients with uh, neuroleptics prior to their first seizure? That's a great question. And I have not, I didn't stumble over that when I did my research, but that is a great question. I don't know if any of the, anyone else can answer their I see the job. I'm not aware of any recommendations. Thank you, Dr. Rosuli. Um, you mentioned that the patient had an empyema at one point? No, did not. Oh, sorry, did I not. might have misspoken, but no. Oh, sorry. No. Then my question is not relevant. <laughs> it was just, just an, a small effusion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? Comments? Just stretching. No, just uh, oh. <laughs> On, on your review of the case, was there anything missed on that first visit? That no, when I look, been... that's a great question. When I look back and um, in the ED note, the patient otherwise looked well and just had some congestion and still a very mild fever. So um, I think it's important that the, the ED physician did a great job and you know gave um, strict return precautions, and the mom ended up following up with her PCP and, and being. In, admitted eventually. So not anything in particular. And where does the influenza come from in H flu in the name? You would ask that. <laughs> I don't know where. Uh, I, I could be wrong. I think I, it, it was first isolated in a patient with influenza and they thought it was a causative agent. So they, back in the day, they would test people to differentiate bacterial flu from non-bacterial flu. But we learned, obviously, that that's not the case. Do you want to switch? All right, thank you, Dr. Rasuli. We will. We will transfer over to Cantwell. Well, I'm one of the PGY3's uh, EM residents. Um, I'm going to be presenting a case of a pediatric GI bleed, and this is a pediatric case conference, so we are not allowed to swear. Um, I have no financial disclosures, unfortunately. Um, our patient was a seven-year-old male presented to the ED with three reported bright red bowel movements over the last two hours without uh, significant stool or mucus as part of them. This was associated with some moderate to severe cramping, intermittent abdominal pain, um, and for the following, the prior two days, 
he'd had what was described by mom as a stomach bug. He'd been nausea, had nausea, and had non-bloody, non-bilious vomiting. Uh, over the last two days, he had had a fever up to Tmax of 102 degrees Fahrenheit at home. I'd had a little bit of decreased urine output, but was still, still urinating, um, and had some decreased PO intake. Um, mom didn't report any rash, cough, he hadn't been complaining of any testicular or scrotal pain, dysuria, back pain, um, or epistaxis. Past medical history, he had no known allergies, he wasn't on any medications or antibiotics. Um, he was up to date on all of his immunizations. He was a former 27-weeker with a history of colitis and abdominal free air in the NICU, but hadn't had any issues since that time. Um, at one year old, he'd had a hospital admission for a pneumonia. Um, he had no history of any milk intolerances, um, special formulas, food allergies, um, or other chronic problems to this point. Um, there was a family history of ulcerative colitis and maternal aunt, uh, as well as colorectal cancer on the maternal side. Uh, he had no known sick contacts. They traveled to Virginia Beach on vacation recently. The only comment in the notes was he had pizza. Um, they had no farm animals, but did have three cats um, and one dog in the house. On physical exam, uh, vital signs, he was mildly tachycardic at 116, but with a normal blood pressure, he was a subbrow. Uh, relevant findings from the physical exam, his abdomen was soft. He had a little bit of lower abdominal tenderness, um, but no peritoneal signs. Um, he, and he had a well-healed scar in the right lower quadrant um, from kind of time in the NICU. Um, GU, he had uh, current jelly stool visible, uh, is what it was described in the note. Uh, he had a small amount of dried blood around the rectum. Uh, rectal exam, we did do one, showed guaiac positive stool without any obvious anal fissure. Uh, skin, he was very pale in appearance. So the first question in the emergency department, of course, we always ask ourselves, especially with a bleed, is is this patient stable or unstable? Um, at this point, this patient was a little tachycardic, um, but had a normal blood pressure. So at this point, we're calling him relatively stable, um, not crashing emergently. So the second question we always have to ask ourselves with any report of bleeding is, is it actually blood? Um, in kids in particular, we have a lot of causes for bloody stools that we need to consider. So things that can cause red stool, um, very well known, is septinir, so some antibiotics. Um, septinir is definitely one um, that you know, we'll see pretty, we see pretty frequently in the ED, and I'm sure the pediatricians see it as well. Um, beets, um, red licorice, or any other kind of foods with a lot of red food coloring can also cause some false positives. Um, black stool, uh, some uh, bismuth preparations, activated charcoal, for whatever reason they were taking that, um, iron supplements um, or other foods such as blueberries, chocolate, um, or a really, really large amounts of dark green foods like spinach or kale might be causes. Um, some false positives, um, someone who eats a lot of rare red meat can definitely cause some false positives and there are some vegetables and fruits that can contain uh, peroxase that can cause also some false positives. Um, we'll use our Guaiac test, this was however positive. Um, so the other next thing you can kind of think about is, is it upper or lower? So in this case, we had right, right red blood, but with an upper GI bleed, we might be thinking we're going to see more melana. Um, so that's that black tarry stool. Um, compared to a lower GI bleed, we're going to be looking for like the brighter red blood um, or dark red blood um, that hasn't been digested by stomach acids. Um, it is possible, of course, to have a very rapid upper GI bleed that doesn't really have time to uh, get digested. Um, but that's more rare. Like a lot of things in kids, uh, we always want to think about kind of different causes by age group. Um, so there are numerous. Um, and so kind of based on uh, age group, neonates, um, things that we're going to be thinking about are swallowed maternal blood, um, necrotizing enterocolitis, um, malrotation with volvulus, uh, Hirschsprungs, milk protein allergies are like allergic causes. Um, infectious colitis can be seen across uh, multiple different age groups. Um, and we always want to, on our physical exam, make sure we're looking for fissures, especially in kids who have constipation. Um, you could get some cracking, um, and which would be cause of bleeding. 
As we get into a little bit older ranges, um, you know, we're going to be thinking about intussusception, um, Meckel's diverticulum, um, other inflammatory bowel diseases, um, even vascular malformations. There's a lot of different causes. So this patient, um, given everything, the tachycardia, the bleeding, we went ahead, we did labs. Um, his hemoglobin was the most impressive um, thing really in all of his labs um, with a uh, hemoglobin of 9.5. Um, other labs were pretty unremarkable. Um, his BUN was not particularly elevated. Um, and um, we did actually have a baseline on him um, of three years prior. His hemoglobin was 13.1. So we did note that he dropped pretty significantly since that. We got some imaging. So we did a KUB, which is shown here. Um, there was no obvious obstructive sign. There wasn't a large amount of stool seen. Um, no free air, nothing else particularly remarkable in the KUB. Uh, abdominal ultrasound was obtained looking for intussusception, uh, which was negative. So in this case, we've got blood. We've got a dropping H and H. So, and our question was maybe borderline unstable kid, so we're going to call some friends. <laughs> so, uh, we made a call to pediatric team um, as well as um, to GI um, and ped surgery actually got involved at this point too um, and continued to follow the patient during his admission. While in the ED, after our consultants were called, or the patient received a 20 mg per kg bolus of normal saline. His heart rate improved a little bit to like the upper 90s. Um, and then about the time the admission or the consultants were paged um, and kind of started to discuss with them, the patient had a repeat dark red bloody bowel movement of about 100 mLs in volume, which was estimated. Um, he became tachycardic again, um, back to about the one teens. Um, but he remained normotensive during that time. Uh, we do repeat labs, uh, which showed his hemoglobin was continuing to drop, um, about another point, a little over a point drop. Um, so the decision was made to admit him instead of the floor to the PICU. On hospital day one, um, over the course of the night, he did not have another bloody bowel movement, but his H&H &H fell to 6.6, .6, um, and the decision was made to transfuse him. Um, obviously, stool studies were collected, lactoferrin, um, infectious uh, uh, labs, um, and he also had a CT of his abdomen and pelvis with IV contrast uh, that was unremarkable. Um, Overnight, he um, continued to do well. He, his H&H &H remained stable into the next day. He had no further bleeding. Um, so the decision was made to transfer him to the floor. Um, he, just before transfer to the floor and actually moving, um, he graciously had two more bloody bowel movements. Um, and repeat labs showed a drop in his H&H &H again from 9.3 to 7.1. Um, so he was held in the PICU. Um, kind of initially that, that blood drop was seen a couple hours later um, and then overnight he received an additional two units. Um, meanwhile, his infectious workup returned negative. Um, he had been tested for, and for those of you who are less familiar, the infectious workup on the stool studies that we generally do here is Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, Yersinia, Aeromonas, um, Placemonas, E. coli, uh, 0157, C. diff, and a Shiga toxin. So all of those were negative, um, and no oviparasites, and his lactoferrin was also normal. So he continued to drop his hemoglobin, again, received those two units, two additional units overnight, um, and the decision was made um, to proceed with another test, which was a nuclear medicine Meckel's um, scan, which showed accumulation, is there a pointer on no, you no. Okay. Which showed uh, a focal accumulation in the right lower quadrant, this bright yellow dot here, um, which was consistent with ectopic gastric tissue. Um, on the kind of planar films of the nuclear medicine scans, this kind of shoots the phase, it shoots it over multiple different time phases. Um, you can see that persistent um, accumulation there in the right lower quadrant. So this was read as consistent with Meckel's diverticulum uh, with ectopic gastric tissue, um, and this patient was taken to the OR. 
Um, so the Meckel's diverticulum was removed. Um, he did very well postoperatively and was discharged home on hospital uh, day six with no more bleeding, no more transfusion. So again, not a lot of parts. So this is a GI bleed from Hallie. Um, Dr. Jo Johann Meckel is, was an anatomy professor at the University of Halle in Germany. Um, he is the person that Meckel's diverticulum was named after, um, was an embryonologist. So taking us way back to our med school days, um, so GI embry embryology, um, basically Meckel's diverticulum arises from the vitiline duct or the ophalomesenteric duct. Um, we kind of vaguely remember the colon when it's forming does this like weird counterclockwise twisting rotation as it turn coat pulls back into the abdominal cavity. Um, and that's really at that max that I know. Um, a lot of developmental anomalies can happen. Um, so Meckel's diverticulum is a true diverticulum with all layers of the bowel wall. So um, we can get both the diverticulum, which is shown right here. Um, we can also see a, uh, just a band that's a remnant. We can see a cyst created in that duct. Um, you can even see a pat patent duct or with prolapse. It's all from the same embryologic structure. Um, this is a surgical pathology of an asymptomatic Meckel's diverticulum that was collected. So you can just see kind of that little outpouching um, off of the small bowel. So the tube, we all heard about this in med school with Meckel's diverticulum. So the classic is Meckel's diverticulum is the tube. It occurs in roughly 2% of the population, two to one male to female predominance, and most of the time it's found within about two feet from the ileocecal valve. Um, they can be up to two inches long, um, and two to four percent develop complications, usually before the age of two. So we get all of the twos in there, and this is really what, what we are classically taught and classically think of when it comes to Meckel's diverticulum. So this is a study looking at um, Meckel's. So you can see, this was a study of pediatric patients. Um, you can see here, this really does highlight um, the male predominance. So we had about 63% um, male. Um, the most common manifestations, manifestations in our pediatric patients are going to be bleeding and intussusception. Um, so that's the biggest thing that we're going to need to kind of keep, keep an eye out for um, and think about when we see those. Um, the Mayo Clinic did a study looking at uh, 14, about a little over 1,400 patients between 1950 and 2002. Um, I think this was retrospective. Um, and looking at those patients, like looking at who had symptomatic Meckel's diverticulum. The symptomatic patients, they had 238 patients. They kind of did some weird stuff with this study. So they had 180, I'm gonna, where they called them adult patients. And when I say adult, they actually made adult age 11 and greater. So it's not really our true adult um, reasoning. Um, and the reason they did that is they wanted to look at kind of what different age groups presented with what symptoms. And if they had defined pediatric as age greater than 18, bleeding would have been the most common cause in both. However, in kids younger than 11, they actually found in this study by separating at age 11 that less than age 11 tended to present more with obstruction rather than bleeding. Um, so that was the main reason for, for kind of their reason for splitting it that way. Um, and then the other group were the 58 pediatric patients that were again age less than 11. Um, one of the biggest takeaways here, um, obviously, is, you know, yes, it's, it's a lot of kids, um, pretty high numbers, um, both um, in the pediatric group over here, um, as well as, like, the age less than 20 over here. I think one of the biggest things, too, to consider, especially for the ED folks in the room, is looking at the numbers of here. Um, 
specifically that this is not just a disease of pediatrics. Um, it does occur in adults too, um, and adults can also have a symptomatic Meckel's diverticulum. Uh, so the study actually had, I think it was a 91 or 92-year-old was the oldest patient they found that was actually clinically diagnosed with a symptomatic Meckel's diverticulum. So risk factors um, from this study, um, they identified four main risk factors uh, for saying that someone pretty likely had me symptomatic Meckel's diverticulum. So they actually had an age less than 50. Um, and again, that's what we just talked about with there was a surprising amount of adults in that population. Um, the mean age was actually 31 um, in that study with a median of 27 years old. Um, male sex continued to be predominant um, and um, it was about, they found it was actually about three to one rather than two to one. But male sex was definitely a risk factor. Um, Meckel's diverticulum that were, with a, had a length of greater than two centimeters um, were more likely to be symptomatic. Um, they didn't find a great correlation with the width of them. Um, and then diverticulum that had ectopic or abnormal features, whether that was ectopic tissue or evidence of infection were also more likely to be symptomatic. That kind of makes sense if, you know, it's an abnormal area, it's more likely to cause symptoms. Um, so they found when all four criteria were met, the proportion increased to like 70%, which makes sense if you've got a known diverticulum with ectopic features. So. So when do we want to consider Meckel's diverticulum in our diagnoses? We can, obviously, you know, we want to consider it, but when do we really start thinking about it? So if we have a patient with painless lower GI bleeding, um, especially kids, without any evidence of gastroenteritis or inflammatory bowel disease, because those are definitely going to be way more common, um, it's definitely something that we're going to want to consider. Um, as we talked about, bowel obstruction is actually one of the more, most common presentations. So especially kids that have uh, intussusception, especially if it's recurrent, um, it's something that we're going to want to consider. Is there something there that's acting as a lead point? Um, moving on, we, you know, especially in adult patients too, even kids, but especially I think this is also going to be really important in adult patients. Um, Patients with acute appendicitis-like symptoms, especially if the appendix has already been removed, um, we're going to want to think about this. Obviously, we can get infections of the appendiceal stump um, that can cause appendicitis-like symptoms, um, but an infected Meckel's diverticulum is also um, something that can cause similar symptoms. And finally, adults with GI bleeding without a source identified on endoscopy or colonoscopy. So takeaways, especially our kids, bleeding, obstruction are going to be really the two main um, presenting, presenting complaints with a Meckles. Um, how do we diagnose it? Uh, there are a bunch of kind of different ways. Um, CT can show it. So this is a CT showing um, a Meckles diverticulum um, that was in, kind of incidentally found. Um, the kind of gold standard or classic thing we've always heard is the nuclear med scan. Um, the specifically, this highlights gastric tissue. Um, so this isn't necessarily going to pick up a Meckel's diverticulum that does not have abnormal tissue in it um, because the uh, protectinate actually specifically highlights that type of tissue. Um, so it's really, it's not so much looking for the diverticulum, it's looking for the abnormal tissue that's in the diverticulum, and that's what shows up. Um, there is some literature about using uh, capsule endoscopy um, that has shown uh, Meckel's diverticulum in the past. Um, there's kind of some problems with that, but I didn't really look too much into in-depth literature on that. So key points with any GI bleed, we want to resuscitate the patient. You want to consider bleeding sources uh, based on the patient's age um, and the history. Um, you want to verify that they're actually bleeding. Um, kind of do they need to be admitted, yes or no, kind of considering vitals, their hemoglobin, um, whether they're actually bleeding, and then 
terrifying level of admission that the patient's going to need. So question one, which of the following is a risk factor for symptomatic knuckle diverticulum? I'm going to take on Maggie Nelson. Uh, boy. <laughs> All right, good. Um, so ectopic tissue present in the diverticulum, correct. And then what is the embryonic origin of Meckel's diverticulum? Andrew Bullen. Okay. Well, all right, the correct answer is D. Um, so the ophthalm smoke as enteric duct and the vitrulline duct. All right. And then um, the classic test um, skipnography is best at detecting what component of a Meckel's diverticulum? A. A is correct. So <laughs> A is correct, um, specifically the gastric tissue. These are my resources. Questions? Thank you. Questions? One, one that I've had is, you know, I felt like this is probably a condition that uh, we don't know the true incidence given the number of yeah. patients that are asymptomatic. Did you find any studies that um, talked about percentages in terms of, of when they do identify a diverticulum, whether there has gastric, pancreatic tissue, other tissue? Any breakdown on those? Um, it, the Mayo study did actually have some percentages laid out of at least in their study what they found as far as how many of the symptomatic specifically had gastric and um, uh, pancreatic, but I don't remember the numbers. So, I mean, they, they, had, they had almost 1,500, mm -hmm. of which about almost 300 were yeah. symptomatic. So they had a fair yeah. number of asymptomatic. So in theory, yeah. you could look at that and say, you know, we think of gastric tissue being more likely to become symptomatic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I want to say like roughly it was probably 60-ish percent were at least the gastric with a significantly lower amount of pancreatic. Um, so gastric was very, very high predominance. Um, and then in the asymptomatic group, uh, they definitely had a pretty, they had a few that had gastric tissue. Um, but again, that gastric tissue, because it's secreting those, like the acids, the chemicals, that was really the risk factor. Um, that's what's that's causing these things to be more likely to be symptomatic. Um, and so in the asymptomatic people, they actually saw a pretty low rate of the ectopic tissue. Any other questions in the room? All right, we'll open up the phone line. All right, I'm going to unmute the phones, please. If you don't have a question, please mute your phone so we do not hear. The conference is now in talk mode. Does anyone on the line have a question? Hey, Dr. Hart. <laughs> <laughs> How did you know? No. <laughs> Hi, um, it's Amy Kreider. I have a question. Amy, we heard you for a second there, and then it cut out. Oh, I'm sorry. I wanted to make sure you heard me. I apologize. Um, I, if I missed it, uh, I apologize. Uh, but why was a barium enema not done on the patient uh, looking for interception? Why was uh, Why was there not a barium enema done looking for interception with his current choice? So he had had an abdominal ultrasound in the emergency department that showed no evidence of intussusception, so we did not proceed any further with uh, like a barium enema at that point. Okay. So abdominal ultrasound is now felt to be sufficiently sensitive for intussusception? That's just new to me. It, that's an evolution since I trained. Now, it, it's not. A, it's not a perfect study, but it it is uh, fairly sensitive. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. 
All right, thank you all.